Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming tonight. Uh, my name is Scott Dwyer. I'm the executive director for Sons of the Revolution in the state of New York at its Francis Tavern Museum. Uh, before I turn uh, the program over to Peter Hine, our board president, I just wanted to welcome uh, everybody here tonight for the preview uh, to our latest exhibition, uh, The Birch Trials at Francis Tavern. This exhibition caps off two years of work uh, to refresh our galleries with new exhibitions, objects, and narratives that relay additional stories of the American Revolution era and the Confederation period, specifically here in New York City, specifically here at Francis Tavern. The Birch Trials at Francis Tavern are key events in the tavern's history at the end of the Revolutionary War, alongside well-known events like the celebration of Evacuation Day and Washington's farewell to his officers. We hope this permanent exhibition highlights how people of color participated in the Revolutionary War on both sides and how people of color uh, and a select group of black loyalists fared at the end of the war uh, right here at the tavern as both the British and American representatives attempted to adhere to the Articles of Peace uh, to ensure a peaceful exit of the British and Amer from American soil. This exhibition is located in our Davis Educational Center, where all of our lectures occur and where we host all of our school programs for students, most of whom come from the New York City school system and our children of color, who will now see the history of black patriots and loyalists on the wall of our museum permanently when they arrive and when they depart the museum. Uh, I want to thank members of our museum uh, team responsible for bringing this exhibition to life here in the Davis Educational Center, uh, Lisa Goulet, uh, Christian Saberwall, and Eric Sussman. Uh, and also thank yous, of course, uh, to Craig Weaver, Museum and Art Committee co-chair, uh, for first championing uh, the opening of this exhibition and seeing it through. Also Board President Peter Hine uh, and Museum and Art Committee co-chair Ambrose Richardson and other members of the Museum Committee for contributing to this exhibition's creation. Thank you again for coming and let me turn it over to Peter Hine. Thank you very much, uh, Scott, and uh, we really do owe a great debt of gratitude to uh, Scott Dwyer, our executive director, and all the staff members who uh, assisted Scott in making this exhibit happen. Uh, I'd like to thank as well uh, the co-chairman of our Museum and Art Committee, Ambrose Richardson and Craig Weaver, uh, for their tremendous work in research and uh, development of this exhibit. And also a special thanks to Craig Weaver, who donated some of the objects uh, shown in this exhibit. Uh, we are going to be uh, uh, have the Commissioner of Cultural Affairs for the City of New York, Lori Cumble, here very shortly. Uh, and uh, when she arrives, we're going to interrupt to have her read a citation from Mayor Adams, which we're very pleased to have. We are also honored tonight to have two representatives of the government of the United Kingdom here. Uh, the Deputy Council General from the British Consulate, uh, Hannah Young, uh, is here. Uh, she uh, served in Number 10 Downing Street as the Prime Minister's lead official on home affairs policy covering subject areas <laughs> ranging from criminal justice reform to counterterrorism and immigration and we're so pleased that she could join us this evening. We also have Sacha Kumiar, who's the counselor to the United Kingdom mission to the UN, and Sacha, thank you as well. So I'm now gonna ask Hana to say a few words uh, as the representative of the British government here tonight. Thank you. Uh, and um, uh, hello everybody, for those of you I haven't met, as Peter says, I'm Hannah Young, I'm the Deputy Consul General here at the British Consulate uh, in New York. Uh, and it's such a pleasure to be here this evening with all of you um, to celebrate and champion a part of our shared history, uh, which, uh, as Peter has said, uh, is grounded in peace uh, and reconciliation. Um, and I want to thank Peter and the Sons of the American Revolution of the State of New York uh, and also to Craig and Ambrose um, for putting together this incredible uh, exhibition which tells actually I think a relatively unknown but hugely important story 
uh, at the end of the uh, Revolutionary War, or as we sometimes refer to it, the original Brexit. <laughs> um, we talk a lot about uh, uh, you guys leaving us, uh, but actually we talk very little about uh, race and the role that black people played as part of that. And I think that's why this exhibition is so uh, hugely important, highlighting the story of the evacuation of, as I understand it, thousands uh, of black loyalists to the UK. Um, and also, as Peter has said, uh, the, uh, the, the collaborative spirit, in spite of everything uh, that had happened to get to that point uh, between the Brits and the Americans to make that happen. Uh, I have to confess, I have not heard about the Birch Trials uh, until Peter and his incredible team reached out uh, to tell me that this exhibition was happening. Uh, but I am so thrilled, and actually I'm so glad, uh, more than anything else, that you can tell this story and that people will be able to come here and understand uh, what happened back uh, in uh, 1783 and the repercussions uh, that have happened since and everything that has come from that. Uh, so congratulations to you and your team. It's an immense privilege uh, for us to be here with you to celebrate the opening of this exhibition. Uh, and I really hope that more people will be able to uh, witness this incredible story uh, of how our two nations work together to emancipate so many black loyalists. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd also like to recognize uh, several other people uh, who are here tonight that we're very pleased to have join us. Uh, Novella Ford, the Associate Director of Public Programs and Exhibitions at the Schomburg Center, Vela. Uh, Todd Hirsch, the Director of Programs and Partnerships at the New York Genealogical and Biographical Society. Ted Knudsen, the Revolutionary Trail Program Manager at the Gotham Center for New York History at the City, of Univers City University of New York the Graduate Center. Uh, past presidents of our society, uh, Bob McKay and Ambrose Richardson, members of our executive committee, Peter Sherwin, our, who is the first vice president, our secretary, Owen Cloder, and treasurer, Alan Borst. We also have our registrar, Scott Jeffrey, here this evening, our second vice president, uh, Ken Chase, uh, our third vice president, Justin Tessier, our chaplain, Father Christopher Cullen, and I might add that uh, Bob McKay, uh, Craig Weaver, and Ken Chase uh, are all members of our Long Room Association. Uh, in addition, uh, we have several other board members here, Ted Andrews, uh, Ray Manning, Alex Pappas, and hopefully I didn't overlook anyone, but if I did, my apologies. I'd also like to recognize as a special guest tonight, Rick Murphy, who spoke here back in September of 2021. Rick is a member of our society, an author of at least four books exploring the contributions made by African Americans in United States history, including multiple ancestors who fought on the Patriot side in the American Revolution, and Rick is now the President General of the Society of the First African Families of English America, and has provided uh, some valuable insights and guidance uh, that uh, were helpful to us in planning tonight's exhibit. So Rick, thank you so much for being here. Cal Calvin Ramsey, um, another member of our society, who has joined us in our color guard, which uh, we very much appreciate, and is an accomplished playwright and uh, author. So Calvin, thank you for coming tonight. Uh, we have a number of DAR representatives, uh, in particular Melinda Allison, who is the vice regent of the Fort Greene chapter of the National Society of the Daughters of the American Revolution and Ruth Hunt, who is uh, 
among other things, uh, she's active in DAR and currently, as I understand it, is the Veteran Affairs Voluntary Service Representative for the Daughters of the American Revolution to the Manhattan Margaret Corbin campus of our uh, Veterans Administration here. We also have a number of members of the Lower Manhattan Historical Association Board here tonight. In addition to our president of that group, Ambrose Richardson, uh, who I've already recognized, I believe the uh, founder of the LMHA, Jim Kaplan, is here or will be here shortly, as well as Vice President Jim. Jim is here. Excellent. And Jim is a former president of LMHA and the founder or co-founder. And uh, also Abby Suckle, uh, vice president of LMHA and board members Wellington Chen and Peter Feynman. Uh, we're also pleased to have representatives of the local press, in particular Allison Simcoe from Broadsheet, who uh, I met earlier this evening, and whose publication I read every day. Uh, so we're pleased uh, to have the press here as well. I will now recognize uh, our co-chairman of the Museum and Art Committee, uh, who have uh, played such a key role in organizing tonight's exhibit. First, Ambrose Richardson, uh, my predecessor as president, will speak about the participation of um, African American soldiers in the Revolutionary War. Ambrose. When we started this exhibit, it was about um, enabling black loyalists to go to Nova Scotia nearby um, to obtain their, their freedom. But as we were putting this exhibit together, Rick Murphy, among others, said you can't overlook the fact that a number of Americans of African descent, a large number of Americans of African descent were patriots including, of course, his ancestors. And we have members of the DAR whose ancestors were also black patriots. So we started looking a little bit more at the, about that. And what we are presenting here today is that history which sort of culminated in the evacuation of a number of, of black loyalists. But this was the end of a process of competition between the two sides for the services of what was 20% of the population of what became the United States. There were black participants in the Boston Massacre. Chris, we start with Christmas Addicts. There were black participants in the battles of Lexington and Concord. There were black participants, two of them persuade in Trumbull's famous picture at Bunker Hill. There were black members of the Continental Army that engaged in the siege of Boston, which resulted in the Americans leaving. And then on December 30th of 1775, after Congress had said, we don't want slaves or freed blacks in the army, get rid of them. Washington said, had, and I said, he sort of had his Bear Bryant moment, said, we want to win this thing, we need these guys. <laughs> it sounds like um, basketball. <laughs> <laughs> it's football, yeah, but it's, yeah, so this was, um, and he asked Congress to reconsider, which they sort of did. They said, well, you can get back the people who had already served. Well, Washington went a little bit beyond that. And it didn't stop there. The American Continental Army was an integrated army. And it's not like statistics were actually kept, but there were specific instances where you know, even former slaves were encouraged to be part of the American effort. The, in 1778, Rhode Island passed an act emancipating slaves who participated as soldiers in the Revolution. Later in 1779, in response, of course, Washington was responding to Lord Dunmore's proclamation in November of 1775 saying, if slaves come and fight for us, they're free. Which, of course, got people excited in Virginia, as you might imagine, and of course Washington was fully aware of that. In 1779, Henry Clinton said, the Americans are recruiting Negroes, we gotta recruit the Negroes too, so forget about fighting, if you serve us, you're going to, uh, we'll, you'll be emancipated and go do this. So this process continued through the war. Um, 
to such an extent that by Yorktown, 25% of the Continental Army was said to be black. I mean, according to Rochambeau's aides at that point. And part of the reason is that a lot of the black soldiers were there for the long haul. They didn't go back when enlistments was up. And of course, part of the terms of their service was that they would be soldiers for the duration. So as to people who were soldiers who risked their lives on the battlefield, I think the Patriot cause employed more blacks than actually the British did who used the blacks more for support. They had the black pioneers, as they were called, to go do that. Um, so the, the result of all of this process, and the end process, which Craig is going to talk about, was the blacks who had supported the British. But we can't overlook the numbers of blacks who supported the Patriot cause and who, who believed in it just for their own freedom and in the cause, too. A lot of free blacks participated in this. That's part of this exhibit and should continue to be part of this exhibit. This is not something, of course, you learn growing up about the American Revolution. There are children's books which have excited great interest when we distribute them to schools saying, wait a minute, we didn't know about this um, because it isn't taught and it should be taught. The list that we have so far compiled of black patriots consist in large part of the pension records. But to qualify for a pension, you had to survive the war by 40 years and be poor. That eliminates a lot of people. So that got up to 5,000. We, we estimate that the number is probably twice as much as that of blacks who actually fought for the Patriot cause. This exhibit includes that because it's part of the context of what finally happened and culminated in this event. But when we get up to that, I'm going to turn it over to Craig to talk about the researches that we did and came up with is what actually happened here and led up to it. Craig? Thank you, Edward. I'm going to just really uh, address three areas, I think. First of all, an overview of the research uh, that was done that went into this. Secondly, the Birch Trials, what they were and what they were not. And then finally, the lasting impact, uh, part of which I think Hannah touched on, I'm going to uh, just elaborate on. So, uh, so here we go. Um, the papers of uh, Sir Guy Carleton were acquired by John D. Rockefeller and uh, given to Colonial Williamsburg very early on in Colonial Williamsburg's history. Exactly where he got them, we aren't completely sure whether they were at auction, how they ended up back on this side of the Atlantic. They certainly didn't stay over here when he, when he went back. But in any event, um, Rockefeller got them, gave them to Williamsburg, and then at the time of the Queen's visit, uh, Colonial Williamsburg gifted them back to the Queen to England. And uh, the Queen in turn gave them to archives in the UK, which is today Q. And um, that is the original set of the records. Um, I spent a considerable amount of time with Mark Wenger, who is an architectural historian who was infinitely helpful to us also in this project, going through, first of all, the facsimiles in Williamsburg because they made copies before they gave them to the Queen. But it's very, very difficult. Um, the ordering of them, the copies themselves, it was quite hard. So I went to Kew last fall and spent two solid days going through hundreds of pages of Carleton's primary documents to both confirm what I thought it said when I looked at it and also find some new discoveries. And it was very, very helpful um, in that regard. Um, the other documents that we looked into in this uh, exhibit were the papers of George Washington because he was the other major player. Uh, Washington's papers from before the time of the establishment of the Birch Trials and after are very, very insightful. Uh, both in terms of receiving letters from people asking, I want my slaves back, as well as Washington's response to a lot of things. And finally, the documents of the commissioners themselves, we certainly searched for, but they were very, very difficult to find. There are some original letters, there are a few pieces of correspondence, but uh, because they were not as famous as either Washington or Sir Guy Carleton, uh, they are not as well preserved and they weren't terribly helpful in the production of this exhibit. But overall, I, I have no hesitation in saying that the amount of research that we did in this is more than has ever been done on the subject. I think it's pretty exhaustive. There's more that can be done, there always is. But it was very, very much in depth. So what, what were the Birch Trials? Well, the commonly written narrative, which I had 
barely ever heard of the Birch Trials, to be honest. Even though I belonged to this group for 40 years, uh, I only marginally heard it occurred in here and never gave it any thought. But then when I did start looking at it, it said, ah, two, three, four thousand people were emancipated. They came and asked for their freedom. Well, that is not exactly um, how it happened. Uh, prior to the establishment of the trials, hundreds and hundreds of African Americans had already boarded ships and were sailing out of New York Harbor. Uh, they had been promised freedom, nobody contested, and they were sailing out. There is correspondence in Washington's files and others when this started heating up, hey, you know, all these people are leaving because the treaty, which remember was not the final treaty, the final one wasn't made into effect until early 1784, uh, but the treaty, Article 7 of it, said that all property, including Negroes, would be returned to their owners. So Washington found himself in a bind. Sir Guy Carleton found himself in a bind because Carleton had promised freedom to everybody that had been fighting for the British cause. And Washington certainly didn't want to disrupt a war that had just been won. Um, I think both of them were very worried. Both wanted to find a way out of this thing. And uh, Congress eventually instructed Washington to uh, enforce the act, which resulted in the establishment upon the suggestion of Carleton of the Birch Tribunal or Birch Trials under Birch. Uh, there were three Americans, there were three British that were named to it. Uh, perhaps Birch himself was present. Uh, we don't have any evidence or statements that he was. He has very scarce records, but it stands to reason that he would be certainly in the beginning since he was the head of all the affairs here in New York in that way. Why would he not have been? The British were much more diligent in showing up. Uh, the Americans were terrible in showing up, probably because the British had their boss right there uh, overlooking it, and the Americans were relatively indifferent, if I were to take a guess at it. Uh, the purpose of the trials was to adjudicate claims by owners against the freedom, freedom of people. Okay, It was not that all of the people that wanted to be free or be able to leave had to come here. Absolutely not. It was if you had a claim against your leaving that had to then be aired and hopefully you would then be deemed to be, to be free. Interestingly enough, most of the cases were local. They, uh, the Virginians who had uh, petitioned Washington for return of these things earlier and, and had said, uh, we want all of this turned over, we want our property back, we're not present in, the, in this, partly because I'm sure just as today no one wants to go to far off jurisdictions for litigation, no one wanted to go to far off jurisdic jurisdictions to try to fight this. Most importantly, it was not an emancipation process, okay? What we are all told is it's emancipation. No, the two certificates, if you look at them there, one of them says you're hereby uh, granted the right to go anywhere that you please. The second one says you have a right to go to Nova Scotia or anywhere that you please. But if you think about that, the ability to be able to go and leave New York meant freedom. Okay, So a final determination was tantamount to emancipation, was tantamount to freedom. Um, there is proof that it was taken seriously. More people were not freed than were freed. They were, they were scrutinized, the evidence, and that's why we have put forth a little uh, reconstruction there of documents on the table and the, the armchair is supposed to be used really we think for Birch and the side chairs would be for the commissioners. Finally what's the lasting impact of this? Well at the time anti-slavery was starting to take hold in the UK as well as in America. Uh, various societies were coming about in England. Josiah Wedgwood, the well-known potter as we all know, in 1787, produced that marvelous image which said, am I not a man and a brother of an African-American in slaves, which was sent around the world, especially to the U.S. market. And um, it, it was really the early, taking until the early 19th century, however, until slavery was killed off, gone in England, and it was going to be much longer in the United States. But the people in charge in America were not dumb. People know when sands are shifting. People saw the drumbeat coming. And what the Birch Trials really did is it started people thinking, albeit in a small step in a very way,
but that up until finally the climax of the Civil War, it continued to build. And it was brought to my attention today, the change in the way it was depicted when I went to my favorite exhibit when I'm back up here in New York at the Public Library on treasures. And I never centered in on this aspect before. We have Paul Revere's print of the Boston Massacre. And if you look, you can barely tell the African-American person in there. By the mid-19th century, the redos of this particular one, which the, which the New York Library has on display, which is done by John Henry Buford, the lithograph, shows an African-American in the center, clearly an African-American. So the tide was shifting in terms of being able to recognize this. Secondly, and I think this is very important, which is what Hannah talked about, which is a war had just been fought. But here you had now the British and the Americans working side by side in what is a tremendously socially significant contribution. And I'm not saying it led to that, quote, special relationship that we still benefit with today with England, but it certainly put us on a lead for many things to come in the future where we've worked together uh, with England. And um, I think that it, it probably was the only example I can think of where African-American relations, slavery, were actually handled jointly, the situation of freeing people by two nations, by two, still the colonies, but by two very significant powers on the globe. And finally, it was right here in Francis Tavern in New York that this happened, what is so amazing. Um, we're within the walls, those wonderful yellow bricks that are still standing, and it's the only place that there's a vestige of the Birch Trials left. The wharfs where the people left are long since demolished. The harbor where they, the boats were there, it's under the East River. But right here is where it occurred, and it's the only place where, uh, where this occurred. And I, just in closing, I guess I'd like to say that yesterday I was talking to somebody about this exhibit, and um, she said to me, well, that's really interesting, sounds great, but people don't come to New York for history. They don't go there like they do to London and Philadelphia and other kinds of places. And I thought for a minute, I thought, hey, you know, there is some truth to that because as a tourist again today, although I worked as a lawyer here 40 years, here I am snapping pictures of Rockefeller Center and the Trade Center. But the truth of the matter really is, we've tried to turn this museum upside down and really emphasize from the State Department that, that originated here to the Birch Trials to Washington's farewell and all the history that exists in this city. I just hope that this is yet another step in making people realize. And I'd ask all of your help in passing the word and trying to make history real in New York. So thanks for coming very much. Uh, we're pleased that Commissioner Lori Cumbo, the Commissioner of Cultural Affairs for the City of New York is here. She will read a citation from Mayor Adams. Uh, Commissioner Cuomo, whom Cumbo was appointed by Mayor Adams in March of 2022. She previously served as Majority Leader in the New York City Council. She has a long record of working to assist many cultural institutions in the City of New York. Uh, Commissioner Cumbo, thank you so much for being here and our welcome. Okay. Thank you so much. Greetings. Thank you, Peter, so much for that introduction. How are you all doing tonight? What an incredible piece of history that we all are experiencing tonight. I have to say, as a native New Yorker, I can't believe that this is my first time here, but it certainly will not be my last. I think everyone should really know about this part of American history, of New York City's history, um, and the cultural intersections that have happened right here at this tavern. And as I was coming in, I was thinking about, you know, when you learn so much about history and, and the different spaces, but as we do our budget negotiations, 
that are taking place um, right now. We're going to vote on a budget in the next two days. But how much cooler would it be if we were meeting at a tavern to discuss the budget? <laughs> <laughs> Sitting in our cubicles on Zooms and going back and forth with OMB. It's not quite the same when you have the opportunity to sit around a table uh, and look people eye to eye and have some food and some drink and to be able to discuss the issues of the day. So my takeaway from this is that we need to have more meetings in taverns like they did some time ago. So I will let Mayor Eric Adams know what I've experienced here today and what we all need to experience in the city of New York. I think it would make people a little bit lighter and a little bit happier and anytime you can bring people together over a nice beer, it makes things for a bit better. That's right. <laughs> so on behalf of Mayor Eric Adams, I'm so proud tonight. This is really an incredible opportunity and I'm definitely going to share with him the incredible experience that I've had here because, again, this is a part of New York City's history that everyone should know. And so I'm going to just read briefly a bit of the citation because the citation does go into great length about the history here. So I will read some of the highlights from Mayor Eric Adams' citation. Yeah. Whereas, as the first capital of the United States, New York City has always boasted a robust spirit of patriotism and national pride. Whereas, the Birch Trials Exhibition will present New Yorkers with the unique opportunity to learn more about the evacuation of black loyalists from New York City at the end of the Revolutionary War. The culminating event in one of the largest emancipations of black people prior to the American Civil War. Whereas, for more than a century, the Frances Tavern Museum has worked to preserve and interpret the rich history of the American Revolutionary Era through public education, lectures, and a wide variety of collections and public events. I look forward to the many ways that the great works of this time-honored institution will continue to help build a better, brighter city for all. Now, therefore, I, Eric Adams, Mayor of the City of New York, on Monday, June 26, 2023, do hereby confer this citation on the Frances Tavern Museum. And I just want to take this opportunity to thank all of you here today. What your presence symbolizes is encouraging um, future generations to know about the history on which New York City stands. And I thank you all for all the work that you do of sharing the work here, of getting that information out to our school groups and young people, but also managing and maintaining this space because it's so important that we preserve our historical landmarks because they essentially give us a roadmap for the future. So again, thank you so much. It's an honor to be your commissioner. And on behalf of Eric Adams, we are gonna deliver the greatest cultural budget in New York City's yeah. history in two days. So keep your fingers crossed and keep pushing because we're gonna make sure that we are the most culturally diverse city in the world. Thank you so much.